Welcome to the podcast today, where we celebrate innovation for a happy planet. I am your host, Abigail Carroll. We are headed to Iceland today to meet Thor Sigfusson, the founder of Icelandic Ocean Cluster, an innovation hub he founded in 2011 to focus on marine startups. Since then, ocean clusters have been popping up all around the world, including the New England Cluster right here in Portland, Maine. It's a delight to have Thor on the show as he has been at the forefront of what is now a quite sizable ocean innovation startup movement. Thor is also author of several books, including one that is hot off the press titled 100% Fish. In this book, his aim is to render fishing more sustainable by making sure we use every part of the animals we pull from the ocean. Let's hear it from Thor. Thank you for coming. Uh, It's been a long time. I've been stalking you on LinkedIn, trying to get you to come on the podcast. So thank you for finally coming on. Well, my pleasure, Abigail. So you are the founder of the Icelandic Ocean Clusters Group. Tell me what you do and how did that get started? I, I was doing my PhD at the University of Iceland and studying how entrepreneurs interact and how they communicate and especially how they become global. And I found some interesting niches there. One thing was that it seemed like entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs from the natural resource industries were a little bit more isolated than others. And I think the reason was basically that natural resources tend to be limited. And in such circumstances, you might have buyers of their services that are a little bit more in their own silos working rather than communicating with others. And so it was kind of an interesting opportunity, I thought, to... uh, try to build more trust and build more synergies using more of the startup world. And, and by that, trying to move us up this value line, which is so important for these uh, natural resource industries, meaning from the basic fishermen to the pharmaceutical level products, you're moving from a natural based industry into a knowledge based industry. Interesting. Which, need, which needs all of the network. Yeah. So what is the model of the ocean clusters? So people understand, what exactly do you guys do? We are basically just matchmaking all all day, meaning that we're trying to create value from different relationships, whether it is with research institutions or education or startups or existing companies or new companies. And so we are also, in that sense, of course, an incubator, but we have also invested in startups and follow them from the early days. So we are kind of a mixture of um, an investment and incubator facility. Great. So you talk on the website about hacking the ocean. What does that mean? Well, we are basically with these hackathons, what we're trying to do is to bring people together to brainstorm about new ideas. With the oceans now, we are really realizing that the, even the ocean space is a limited space. So we need to be kind of clever to figure out a way to uh, get companies to collaborate as well, maybe come up with multi-use space, multi-use islands even. So there could be uh, opportunities there as well. So Iceland is a unique, has a unique geography and you've really been a pioneer in this ocean entrepreneurship space. Why is Iceland important in your formula? Well, I think in many ways, we have, of course, kind of unique situation here, which is that uh, Iceland is so much based on the ocean economy still that we have, of course, survived through the ages by catching fish, but at the same time, we have not that many other resources. We, of course, have the geothermal power and we have the fish. So what we've had to do is to be kind of careful with our resources and really think of all practical ways of creating value from all parts of the fish and creating as much value as possible. When you have an industry that is so big in an economy, you cannot afford to be careless with this industry. And that's probably where I'm kind of spoiled with starting the tractor in this environment, because we have this mindset already in place, partly at least, where the fisheries are anxious to do better all the time and create yeah. value and, and invest. Well, there's that sort of idea that scarcity breeds creativity. Brilliant, absolutely. So maybe that's that's part of it. So 
I'd love to put this a little bit in context because I was living in Europe at the beginning of the big financial crisis, global financial crisis, and Iceland really uh, was a particular victim in that crisis. And it seemed to me and some other observers that maybe Iceland had gotten too far away from its fundamental core values of of fishing and these marine economy. Um, Just curious about what your take on that was. And was this shift back into natural resources part of your inspiration? Yes, for sure. I think we all realized that we were a little bit ahead of ourselves. I think part of the whole thing is that we've actually had a higher birth rate for years than most European countries. So it tends to be that we have a little bit younger leadership in business. Very interesting. And we still have quite a lot of young people that are leading our companies. And it may be that um, there was a lack of experience partly, but more dynamism. And I think that's one of the things that we have. But we learn definitely from the mistakes I feel in the past. So we have a very stable um, financial system right now. But at the same time, especially in the first five or 10 years after the, the crisis, there were so many ideas that were coming forth, which had to do with building on our, on our base more. More food techs were created, more interest in full utilization, more, more interest in upcycling. And all these new ideas, they got this space that was needed and this attention that was also needed for our small economy. But maybe also just the fact that Iceland had gone through this phase of becoming a financial center brought certain core competencies that you also need to promote uh, an entrepreneurial generation. All those financial skills are important. That's a really good point. And I think it's absolutely partly the success of the tech world in Iceland now is that we have quite many people that have the experience from international finance. So that's a part, mm-hmm. definitely a part of that. So what are some of the most important themes that you're seeing in blue tech innovation today? Oh, there are so many. I just absolutely love that question. The carbon capture of the seaweed, which I think is extremely important. The whole fish farming now is growing quite fast in Iceland. And I'm especially interested in the land farms and seeing how we can use this amazing amount of fresh water that we have in Iceland. But... uh, I think also the the new technology that's coming from various startups, not only here, but also in many European and, and many countries all around with regards to how to preserve the oceans, how to do better with our fisheries. And we have some examples now within the ocean cluster that I'm, I'm so excited about. One thing is, for instance, using lights rather than nets to hurt the yeah. fish, which of course saves a lot of energy. We have artificial intelligence now coming into the industry with full force. So we are seeing that in both with the um, safety of, of the fishermen, more sustainable catch, all kinds of issues that are definitely coming. But the main thing is to allow the entrepreneurs, the young entrepreneurs, the innovators to have this space that is so needed. And that's what I believe we're getting better at each year. Very interesting. So you have a project called Codland, which is all about the 100% utilization of the fish. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, we started in the early days of the cluster with a company called Codland that actually moved into uh, now a collagen business plan for creating value from the fish skin, which was not very well used in the past. And so Codland established a company called Collagen which is now actually a company that is operating a factory in Iceland where we take around two to 3,000 metric tons of fish skin and create collagen, which is a protein good for the joints and good for the skin. But we have, we're now taking this 100% ideology all around. And I think it's so great that we, we find suddenly that uh, there is so much interest in the circular economy that yeah. circular seafood has not been sort of high on the agenda. And I must tell you that I was meeting with amazing people in Korea last week. And what's so great is that I met people from various Asian countries and we were presenting our 100% fish, the idea basically to say, use the the things that you've been throwing away to create value. Don't think that you can catch more, just use more of what you have. And people came to me and said, we've never thought of that. 
So it was such a great experience to feel that we're coming with something on the agenda that has not been high on the agenda so far and even has been a part of the black hole. So we are, we are opening like new doors for people to look at the opportunities. And in Iceland, we are, of course, a prototype of what we can do. We're using now over 90%. I'm just trying to be sort of careful. Wow. The fact is we don't see that much waste anywhere. And there should not be any waste in the seafood industry. But to do that, we need to connect the startups and the research and the industry to get this trust building going. As I've been, you know, exploring companies and opportunities with this podcast, I keep hearing these older values coming back. And one of them is no waste. I mean, this is something our grandparents taught us. Mm. Uh, they didn't throw out anything. So you've taken this 100% fish idea a little bit further and you've, you're coming out with a book called 100% Fish. So tell yeah. me about the book. And this is not your first book. No, it's actually not my first book, but I think it's a topic that I've, is very close to my heart, of course. And what I did there is to try to combine the knowledge and stories from companies all around the world. The fact is the seafood industry has so many companies that are outstanding. The willingness of the, many of these family companies to do better with their resources is so deep in their culture. The only thing they are not really good at is telling these stories. Yeah. They seem to be still a little bit isolated and thinking that no one is interested. And I, I feel partly that's right. We find that people still think that the seafood industry kind of, kind of sturdy, uh, old fashioned, etc. But the fact is, we see so many companies that are actually outstanding, doing more with the whole fish and no waste. And they're doing all these things also with environmental issues regarding technology, etc. And I wanted to tell this story. I wanted to make sure that people knew and even other companies would be able to take these stories and say, we can do the same. We can do as, as well as these uh, companies are doing. And it's basically my mission now is to say there should be no waste in the seafood industry. We have an opportunity with the seafood industry to create the cleanest food in the world, the food with the lowest carbon footprint in the world. And we're so far away into it that we only need few steps to take further with the industry to make sure that we can talk about that and, and, and announce it much more, much higher than we've done in the past. That's amazing. So were the marine economies more wasteful than the land economies historically? Uh, not, I think not in Iceland and many of the developing countries, for instance, they are basically using all of their fish species. Yeah. The problem in many developing countries is basically the heat. Yeah. So there's a lot of food waste just because of, of rottening food. But I think um, we will see, sadly, the waste in nearly all food industries. But it is changing fast. But we feel that the seafood industry in Iceland is definitely in the forefront here on a global scale. And we want to tell that story, not only to brag about it, but more to tell people that they can do as well as we are doing. If they just bring different people, different skills together to yeah. create this value. So is there data to suggest, you know, how the world will change if we are more efficient and we use 100% of these fish resources? Yeah, I'm trying to count it. It's so amazing if you look at the 10 million metric tons. And I'm saying these are tons that are already caught. So these yeah. are tons that are already caught, so they don't need any CO2 to be brought to shore. Right. And can you imagine 10 million metric tons becoming fish meals or meals? These are billions of, of plates. So if we would just do that, just to create fish meal from many of these waste streams, so-called waste streams, we could feed millions, millions of people. Wow. That's basically the opportunity here. With no added carbon footprint, basically. Exactly. But I'm also saying, Abigail, that what I think is so interesting as well is that when I'm visiting many coastal areas all around the world, we find that the same message is there that they need to catch more to survive. Yeah. But we're actually saying you might do as Icelanders have done, which is actually to create much more value from the products that you are defining as waste. And we have yeah. so many amazing examples from Iceland and actually from Norway and other countries where we are creating much more value from the parts that now are used for landfill in other countries. Amazing. So the ocean clusters, 
is a bit of a movement now. You've created a, a, a global movement. There are ocean clusters now popping up all over the world, inspired by you and part of your network. Can you tell me about that? We had actually uh, seen that the interest in the global scene. We, of course, probably started full force in the U.S. with the New England Ocean Cluster. Yep, I know them well. We had a great team there that uh, has been helping startups and using very much similar models as we have. And then we uh, we went to Massachusetts, to New Bedford, and then over to Alaska. We are now going over to Europe as well. We are seeing similar clusters in the Asian countries, but uh, there's not a really a, a strong business plan behind it from our point of view. And I, we are not really that enthusiastic about the the business for us in that. And I'm honest to tell you, the, the fact is we just love the idea that we can actually help others to create these clusters and create more positivism in the seafood industry. I think it will benefit all seafood countries if people realize all around the world the opportunities that we have and how well we're doing it, then we will benefit from the Icelandic perspective as well with regards to higher prices for our products and, and of course, possible export of our knowledge, technology, etc. Wow. Amazing. And I mean, and then the, a better running planet. That's how the ultimate payback uh, is better absolutely. air, better, yeah. you know, yeah. better, better food. We're going to take a short break, but when we return, we'll hear what inspired Thor to build the blue economy and why he thinks writing can be an important tool for emerging brands. A big thanks to the Maine Technology Institute, MTI, investing in innovation for a prosperous Maine. MTI is Maine's unique public-private partnership whose core mission is to diversify and grow Maine's economy by accelerating innovation in the state's targeted technology sectors. MTI offers grants, loans, equity investments, and services to support Maine entrepreneurs and organizations as they transform their innovative ideas into new products, services, and companies, leading to the creation of quality jobs for Maine people. For more information about MTI and its programs, please visit maintechnology.org. For a blue economy to thrive, people need to use more sustainable products. But which products? And will consumers actually adopt them? Innovators like you are hustling to figure this out. Spark number nine can tell you if there's demand for your product. Spark markets your product before it's built using online advertising so you launch smarter. Have a big idea? Vet it with Spark before you build. Visit Spark online at www.sparkno9.com or find them on LinkedIn. Maine Venture Fund is a state-sponsored venture fund here in Maine with a mission to support the highest potential Maine-based startup companies by investing early-stage capital. Maine Venture Fund's goal is to accelerate job growth and economic opportunity for the people of Maine. Learn more at mainventurefund.com. Welcome back to Happy Planet. My guest today is Thor Sigfusson, founder of the Icelandic Ocean Cluster Innovation Center and author of the book, 100% Fish. So how did you get interested in this blue economy? I mean, you said you were doing a PhD. Tell me about your background and how this all really got started. Well, I was born in a small fishing village in the Westman Islands, which is south of Iceland. And I, I'm not sure how it all started, I must tell you. I think it's partly it was a coincidence, but I was actually reading about my great uncle in the Westman Islands. He was into fisheries. And there is a line that is now I'm cherishing where they say he was one of the first in Iceland to start utilizing byproducts in his fishing operation. And I had no idea. It's so in your I'm DNA, Tor. And I'm, don't, I'm wondering whether it's the DNA or whatever. But I, I wrote an article when I was in high school for a school magazine, which was actually called Gold from Gufts. And the idea there was to talk about this, but then I actually forgot it for 20 years, went into all kinds of other businesses and came back to it after the financial crisis. People say that I'm interested in 100% fish. The fact is, Abigail, I'm absolutely obsessed with the idea. <laughs> uh, I love it. And you have to be to push something this far. And you have. So you were really kind of at the forefront of this whole ocean economy movement. And how how did you launch this 
from a country of 372,000 inhabitants. I mean, everybody thinks you've got to go to Silicon Valley to launch a global startup, but you've sort of managed to do something quite profound on a global scale, sitting at home in a country you love. Yeah, first of all, I'm not the one, I'm not the only one, definitely. I took stories that others had been writing and started to talk about them. And that's one of the things that I, as I told you at the beginning, seafood countries have not been good at. So I must admit, I, I am not the whole story here. There is a story before me. No, of course. I have a large team with me, but I think one thing that I'm always been interested in is to try to inspire others from the beginning. So as soon as we started talking about these stories, people realized that there was something there that yeah, you know, was of interest. So uh, I must admit, I'm kind of spoiled in this respect, both with a marvelous team with me, but also coming from a country where this has been the pride for years and years. We just didn't realize that there was a story there until I guess my team thought of it and said, well, let's talk about this more on, on the global scene. And that's been definitely our success. Well, it's interesting, and I, I was gonna, I wanted to ask you, because you have written several books and articles, and a lot of young entrepreneurs are listening, how impactful can writing be for emerging brands? Like, how important is that? That's a good question. People really don't understand why I'm always writing these books. For me, it's more like finalizing a, a thought. You know, you have all these thoughts in your mind that you really think that let's try to put this into a structure. That's why I did my PhD as well. So for me, it's been a, a really good journey to uh, try to understand a little bit better how we can take things further. And sometimes I feel always that I'm I'm writing my mantras, my sort of uh, maybe guides. I'm trying to be, I think my, my grandfather was a teacher and uh, my father was a teacher and partly I think the whole thing is like some teacher's elements that are there. And I just love the idea that I may spread the word and get others interested. And those that are really interested might actually read some of my books and get more inspired to take both the cluster idea further and now the full utilization further. That's great. So speaking of your book, uh, where, where are people going to be able to buy it? When, when does it come out first? Well, it's a really good timing for, for us now because it was printed in Europe and it's going to be sent to the U.S., I think, next week. Oh, wonderful. But it should arrive today at my office. So I'm kind of excited. <laughs> I, I'm oh, not that's kidding. wonderful. I'm not kidding. Congratulations. Not kidding. Yeah. It will be, it's on Shopify. Shopify, uh, okay. 100% fish.com. Uh, that's where people can order both the e version and the printed one. Oh, wonderful. Great. And I'd like to know, and I ask this of everybody, are you optimistic about the future of our ability to stay ahead of climate pressures and feeding a growing planet? Well, this is a tough question. I'm not sure how to answer it. Of course, what I worry about is, of course, our oceans. They're getting yeah. hot, sour, and breathless. This and, summer. Yeah, and, and the thing is, we are actually in the absolute most risky position being in the, the North Atlantic, close to the Arctic Circle. This is a, a huge issue for Icelanders. And, and the fact is also, it's very hard to be alone in that debate, you know, because we feel a little bit that it's always like a, an, an issue that should be highest on the agenda, but tends to go a little bit further down with wars in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, of course, I'm, I'm worried, but at the same time, what has happened through the years that I've been with the cluster is that, is that when I started talking about maybe not the word circular economy, but at least the, the no waste cluster and the whole idea of sustainability, I felt that these were often the CEOs just talking to me and they would be like, yes, I'm trying to get it on the agenda, but I have many other things on my desk, etc." But now I feel that the whole circular economy is at all levels in companies. So I'm meeting the, comp the people that are at the third or fourth level, and they would just absolutely be the, in the forefront of sustainability and climate change issues. So that is the, the, the genes the, or the DNA of the companies that we're in relationship with. 
tends to be quite different now. It's just all the way up and down. Yeah. People yeah. are enthusiastic and this is going to make a difference. We find that yeah. there are so many activities now that are that are going to make a huge difference in the years to come. I feel like it's a bit of an upwelling sometimes too. It is coming from the younger people who are not necessarily at the top. And so it's getting harder and harder for the executive team to ignore these issues when their their employees are so um, you know, rightly obsessed with them. I mean, we're, what what kind of world are they are they buying into? Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you have advice for young entrepreneurs today who may or may not be in the marine sector? Well, one thing is just to look at the and, and maybe mask the opportunities in the blue sector because it's kind of it's a black hole for young people. Even in Iceland, when I started with the cluster, there were young people that were telling me that well, my my great great grandfather or my great great grandmother was uh, was in fisheries, but of course, I, I'm not willing to be on board these boats, and uh, and that that's the end of the story. And we have been trying to just trying to tell people that there are so many opportunities to make a huge difference in this sector, not only in wildcats but also in fish farming, in algae, in various like now the wind farming is coming. There are so many uh, um, inspiring uh, opportunities. But we need to tell the entrepreneurs that there is still a, a lot of work to be done. And if they join our movement, they will find more and more uh, higher numbers of investors that are interested and grants as well. For many of the small startups in Iceland, the key was the small grants from government, from science committees in government to start their companies with ideas. From that, they met with, these, with, with investors and so forth. So I would say just mask the opportunities and, and think about the difference that you can make by being in your coastal area, thinking outside of the box yeah. and seeing opportunities that may be to create jobs and value and help the environment as well. So how would some young entrepreneur today get involved with an ocean cluster organization, be it in the States or in Iceland? Well, in our case, of course, and the same is with New England, is that if you have an idea, you should just call us and, and talk to us and see what we can help you with. We have a space here within the Iceland Ocean Cluster, similar to what they have in Maine, for instance, where you can have a, a small table, meet people that are interested in these topics and see, share ideas, get knowledge and get help with your business plan, get help with your first networking. And from there, we we see many companies blossom. But I think the main thing is to sort of, I would say in the old days, lift, lift up the phone and, and give us a call, but uh, at least be in touch and share your ideas. The good thing about the new generation now, Abigail, is that young generation tends to be open to share ideas. This yeah. was the tough problem in the past when and innovators were holding on to their ideas, always saying it's so precious that I can't talk about it. And it did, didn't go anywhere. Now young people are just spreading their ideas through all kinds of social media, getting a response, building networks. And this is the opportunity that we have. We just have to get them to realize how amazing opportunities it is to make difference in the blue economy. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's inspirational. And I, I think you're really right about a, a new culture of sharing ideas and not harboring secrets. It's really hard to move forward if nobody can know what you're doing. Then no one can help you. Exactly. I, you know, it's funny. I feel like communities build companies more than people. I mean, a community has to sort of want you to succeed. Like you put yourself out there, your idea out there, and, you know, you, you need those clients. You need the suppliers. You need all these people, and they have to have a willingness to, to join your team. And uh, it's hard to do that in a silo. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Thor, for coming today. It was a huge honor to have you on this podcast. It really uh, made me very happy. And I'm sure listeners are going to be really excited to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Abigail. It's been a great pleasure to meet you. We will have links to the Iceland Ocean Cluster, Codland, and his book, 100% Fish, in our show notes. 
Thank you once again for listening. Please follow Happy Planet wherever you tune in and leave us a rating and review. It really helps new listeners discover the show. Happy Planet was reported and hosted by me, Abigail Carroll. I am also the executive producer. The talented Matt Patterson is our producer and editor. Composer George Brandel Egloff created our theme music. Learn more about my work and get in touch by visiting happyplanetpodcast.com.